Retreat Summer School. We have come down to the last session of our first day summer school. And the topic the speaker we have, we have great speaker, very well-known speaker around the world. They'll be speaking on the topic of innovation, technology, and destination government management. So uh, before we jump into the session, just a quick guidelines uh, for our session for the participant. Uh, please make sure you're joining on time and your laptop is well charged because there are a lot of nice topics are coming out and very good presentation, very presentable on your camera whenever we are taking a group photo. Uh, try to chat very responsibly and be respectful to your colleagues and academics joining around the world and try to minimize the distraction. So uh, our session will be same as usual that we have done in the last session. Please post your question through Slido. I will highly encourage that. Make sure you scan the code from the screen as well as our team will be posting direct link to post your question for this particular session. So we are going to introduce our moderator for this session. It's none other than Dr. Siamak Sefi. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Siamak, for moderating this session. He is from University of Ulu, Finland, and he will be moderating this entire session with very good speakers uh, who will be speaking on innovation, technology, and destination government management. So over to you, the floor is yours. Uh, Dr. Siamak, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rupam, and uh, hello to our participants, and good, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, as Dr. Rupam said, depending on where you are. Uh, welcome to the uh, second Creed Summer School on Innovation and Technology to achieve uh, SDGs. In this session on innovation, technology, and destination governance and management, uh, we have a three wonderful speaker from Australia, New Zealand, and France. Uh, after each uh, speaker delivered the talk, there is a time for questions. And please uh, follow the instructions given in the chat box for, for asking your questions. Uh, all right, so let me introduce uh, our first speaker, Professor Noel Scott. Uh, he's a joint professor of tourism management in the Sustainable Research Center, University of Sunshine Coast, Queensland, Australia. Uh, his research interests include the study of tourism experience and destination management and marketing. He is a frequent speaker at academy and industry conferences. He has over 300 academic publications, including 17 books. He has supervised 30 doctoral students to the successful completion of their thesis. He is on the editorial board of 10 journals, a member of the International Association of China Tourism Scholars, and a fellow of the Council for Australian Tourism and Hospitality Education Management. He is the author of a number of publications which have been widely translated. Thank you very much, Professor Scott, to be with us today. And the all floor is yours. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Simic, and uh, it's very, very nice to be here um, again and also to have the opportunity to talk um, uh, to quite a wide range of um, participants. Uh, it's impressive to to know how many people uh, are at the uh, have joined the conference. So well done to uh, Taylor's. I'm going to uh, share my screen now. Let's see if I can do this. Um, can you see that okay, I think? Is that good? Yeah. Yes. yes. Excellent. Thank you. Well, so that's probably the hardest part of my presentation done. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, a topic uh, that is very important. It actually touches upon some of the uh, discussions that were in the previous session, um, especially that by uh, Mariana Sagala, who was talking about, you know, how uh, how how we're just going to go back to the way things were in development of tourism, and um, uh, so this this presentation sort of touches a little bit on that. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, responsible tourism, and so the first thing, of course, that an academic should do is to try and understand what 
responsible tourism is. And uh, it's a funny old thing. Um, this, this definition came from 2008, Bramwell Lane, McCabe, Mosdale and Scales. Uh, so a lot of uh, English, um, uh, well-known English authors in tourism. And they said that uh, tourism is um, about having a sense of ethical and moral responsibility beyond self-interest. So you have a sense of ethical and moral responsibility towards the need for sustainable development. Okay, so if you are um, a person who is responsible um, within the tourism sector, then you have a sense of moral responsibility to try and achieve sustainable development. And you could be one of many different types of people. You could be a tourist. You could be an industry manager. You could be an employee working in a, in a business, a uh, tourism business. And uh, you could be uh, uh, an industry association manager, perhaps, a politician, someone in government, presumably in the Ministry of Tourism. You would be you could be a, a person working in a non-government organization or even in the host community so the the issue is um what we need if we're going to have responsible tourism are these people to be ethically and morally committed towards achieving sustainable development well that's good I imagine that many of the people listening today are committed, who might have a sense of ethical and moral responsibility towards um, developing sustainable tourism and sustainable development, thinking about the future of our world. But, um, of course, not everyone does. And it would seem from what I was uh, listening to Mariana Segal talk in uh, Santorini, where she was, there was perhaps a sense that um, there was no moral and ethical responsibility for sustainable development amongst those making decisions in uh, in that destination. Okay. Now, so so if we want responsible tourism, we need politicians, government staff, all these people we talked about to have a sense of ethical and moral responsibility towards sustainable development. Very easy conceptually. Uh, the problem is, let's take an example. So uh, firstly, let's assume that we've got a variety of people who, who could we could help to develop a sense of responsibility. Who would we pick first? Would we pick um, a employee in a business? Well, yeah, sure. He'd be that'd be he or she would be a very good candidate to improve um, to to have that sense of responsibility and to do everything within their power to to improve sustainable development. But perhaps a person who had had more influence in that matter would be a, a, a business manager. A person who operates a business employs that staff member and can uh, make changes to the business to be more sustainable, thus demonstrating that they have this sense of responsibility. Well, that'd be good. But probably we might pick um, a minister for tourism as having even more influence and ability to change. Uh, or to to not only demonstrate their uh, ethical responsibility, but actually to do things. So there's no point in having ethical responsibility towards sustainable development if you're not actually going to implement anything. And if you're going to implement anything, then you would normally um, influence things within your control. The people who have the most control, of course, tend to be higher up in the tree. The Minister for Tourism, the, uh, uh, um, the Destination Management Organization, 
perhaps some of the larger tourism businesses, the airport and so on. So if we want to um, develop sustainable tourism and we're going to do it through people who can implement and make changes to sustainable tourism, we might want to understand who, if our Minister for Tourism has a sense of ethical and moral responsibility towards tourism. You see, there's no, um, not yet anyway, there's no vetting of the people in the tourism industry to check to see if they have any ethical and social responsibility for tourism. That's the problem. Maybe in future, if you want to be seen, if you want to apply for the job of the Minister for Tourism in Greece or the um, destination management, a destination manager for Santorini, you might actually have to demonstrate that you actually have a um, ethical and social responsibility for tourism. So there's our problem. It's not the technology and it's not even the systems we have. Ultimately, the problems of sustainable development come down to the people who are making decisions and whether they have, in fact, the requirements to do them in a way which are um, sustainable. So some suggestions. We want to try and achieve these wonderful um, SDG goals. Of course, there's no um, there's no evidence as yet that we have made any difference to these goals, but let's assume that we intend to do that in future. Then, how do we how do we actually um, measure our progress? Well, the thing that comes from governments and their stated intentions towards sustainability, the lesson is that you can't measure intention. Intention to undertake sustainable development or intention to do something doesn't work. Uh, there's, and there's very good reasons for, um, for that in terms of how people think. There is an intention action gap and that's not unusual. So you can't assume that if a person says they are, go they are going to be ethically and morally responsible, they will do it. In fact, in most cases, they will not. Not because they're lying, but because in a particular situation, they would like to, but then they move on and some things change and there's an economic crisis or something and their good intentions are lost. So you can't rely on um, intention. You've got to rely on action. Uh, the next thing is, uh, who would you focus on if you were wanting to find out, find people who were ethically and morally responsible? That is, people who are going to help to change um, responsible tourism. Then you would actually want to know that the people in the highest jobs, the most influential people, are, resp um, uh, are responsible. They are have this ethical and uh, social responsibility. And so maybe we should ask them. Maybe we could ask uh, our local uh, tourism destination managers what, not what they intend to do in future, but what they have done over the past two years in order to demonstrate their uh, responsibility. Mm -hmm. And we would especially want to talk to and ask that question of those who have the, law, the, the most power. That is, those who, are, um, who have wide and strong legitimate influence in tourism. That is, those people, um, typically an, an airport would be one of these people. An airport gets lots of tourists and they have a legitimate in interest and influence in the type of tourism that occurs. Uh, similarly, destination management organizations, local governments, large hotels, um, large attractions. 
transportation systems. They're the people who we need to find out if they are actually responsible, if they have this ethical responsibility for towards tourism. Um, it's good to know that um, an, an individual person or tourist has this ethical sense of responsibility towards sustainability. But the problem is one person, one individual isn't going to make much difference. Um, stakeholders. So we should also try and find stakeholders who perhaps are influential in key parts of the economic system or even the natural system. So national park managers probably would have that sense of responsibility, but um, dive operators going into a national park may or may not if they're if it's a marine national park. Um, so how can we change their, how can we influence them? Well, this is where the theory of planned behavior is actually right. Most of the time, the um, theory of plan, planned behavior is not predictive, but the, in terms of social norms, if you can change social norms in society or in the organization or in the environment of a person, that will probably change their opinions. So um, if you can change the social norms, get community vocal and uh, involved in, in uh, wanting sustainable tourism, asking difficult questions, then that will probably lead or is more likely to lead to changing the in the the behavior or the the social ethics displayed by influential people and that's sort of the way the world has been changing over the past 30 years or so you know um there's this ground swell uh, swell convincing people that um the environment needs changing you know we need to respond to environmental uh changes and slowly 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 the large corporations and things to some extent are addressing those issues, although they will ma maintain uh, that power and, and control as long as they can. Okay, so um, that's pretty much my my summary. Uh, uh, Dr. Simak, um, there's, uh, these were questions that I was sent. Would you like me to talk about those? Or was that your job? You've, you've Sorry, my, yeah, yeah, I was unmuted. Well, actually, uh, we will have some questions uh, at the end of the three presentations. I said at the beginning of the, at the end of each presentation. Oh, okay. So we will wait for three presentations, then uh, that will be followed by the questions to the uh, each speakers, let's say. Oh, all right, okay. Well, I'll, so I'll go on then, and I'll, I'll just um, then um, pretty much, I don't know how long we've been talking for. I can talk underwater usually, but... Um, Today, things have gone very quickly. Um, so conclusions. Um, I'm trying to not be an academic here. I'm not trying to tell you definitions and things. I'm trying to get you to think, well, what can we do? Because we're talking about responsible tourism. So this is about demonstrating that we all individually have this sense of social and moral responsibility to improve sustainable tourism. So what do we do? What's, what, are our, what are the actions that we actually can make ourselves or encourage others to do? Well, first of all, we would um, ch try and change social norms, those the influence of uh, the, the social people around us, our networks and things. Although that's hard because mostly if you are a person with a, a certain ethical stance, normally your friends have the same ethical stance. So uh, that's the principle of homophilia. People who are have the same beliefs and ideas usually are friends together. So it's not going to be very helpful for us individually to try and change our uh, our networks, the, the, the opinions of our networks, because they will probably be the same already. Uh, but we can certainly work on a wider social uh, level. In terms of uh, key stakeholders, I really like the idea of employing people 
in key jobs who can demonstrate that they that they have a sense of social and moral responsibility. We have we have an interesting case in Queensland where the government wants uh, the the state government wants to put in um, cabins accommodation into a national park and they say oh yeah this will be okay with this uh, these people over here they they want to put this these cabins into the national park be great for tourism the place will develop but when you actually go and find the background of the people who are going to be operating these cabins they have no background in anything to do with the environment or with nature they're business people. So the question is, do they have a sense of moral and uh, ethical responsibility for the environment? Because they're the type of people who should be implementing things in a national park, tourism activities in a national park. So can we judge people? Can we require people in public office or in working in national parks or working in tourism to actually have that if they want to work there that might be an interesting one and then but but of course the other thing is you can be a small um homestay you can you can only see four or five people a year tourists but demonstrate to those people that you have this this sense of responsibility and ethical commitment. The problem is, and so so if we were judging how much um, how much change a person is able to do, we might expect that that, um, that small tourism operator make some change in terms of the people who come through their their uh, accommodation, stay overnight, talk to them, but we would have to say that their the amount of change that they make, while good, would be small compared to someone who has a lot of resources. So what we would be expecting is those companies or people or government organisations with the most resources would be making the most change. And of course, they're not. So um, that's perhaps where we need to call them into account. Okay, so um, that's pretty much th There are a series of references here. Um, which are incredibly useful and interesting. Um, and I think there's from uh, uh I think because of the internet connection we miss the last part of Professor Scott's talk. I don't know if he's still with us. Yeah, yeah, I can. Professor Scott, I think uh, uh, you are unmuted. Yeah, you're still unmuted, actually. We cannot hear you. Yeah, now it's fine. You're. I apologize. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. This is my, I'm having a fight with the local telecommunication company. They don't like me, but um, it'll be fine. Uh, so all I was going to say is uh, uh, I, I'm not sure where I dropped out, but um, uh, I was talking a little bit about um, the, uh, the importance of uh, our influential people, the people who are influential in the tourism sector, demonstrating this sense of, um, moral and social responsibility and that i think would be the best or one of the best ways to move forward and to uh, try and achieve some change especially within the tourism sector um, 
and we should be looking for the people who have the most resources and are the most influential to be the first to demonstrate those things, which gives us uh, someone to look at. And then uh, as I was leaving, I, 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 I mentioned that there is a series of references that uh, I've got, um, one of which I'm sure is by Michael Hall, um, but I couldn't see it at the moment, but I'll pass on to him to uh, explain um, his ideas. Very right, good. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Scott, for uh, for this inspiring talk. I would say that on who is who and who does what when it comes to responsibility and ethical and moral responsibility for and toward uh, tourism and the legitimacy and interest of all partners involved in tourism. Uh, we will have our uh, next speakers with us, Professor Michael Hall. Uh, let me introduce. Professor Hall. Uh, professor Hall is currently a professor in marketing in the Department of Management, Marketing and Entrepreneurship at the University of Canterbury, New Zealand. He's uh, currently a docent in Geography, University of Oulu, Finland, a visiting professor in the tourism program at Linus University, Sweden, uh, guest professor in the Department of Service Management at Lund University in Sweden. Uh, and he has also some other visiting professorship in Sweden, uh, Finland, Malaysia. Uh, he's also a frequent visitor to the geography department at UMA University. A prior position in Australia, New Zealand and elsewhere include a professor in tourism at the University of Otago, where he was also head of department for six years. Uh, professor of Tourism and Service Management at Victoria University of Wellington, uh, visiting professor at Sheffield Hallam University, UK, and Center for Tourism Studies, University of Eastern Finland, and honorary professor uh, in the Department of Marketing, uh, Stirling University, Scotland. Uh, uh, professor Hall has honorary doctorate from several universities, the University of Uma in Sweden, University of Oli in Finland, Lund University, Sweden. And according to the uh, Google Scholar analysis for the, uh, for the category of tourism, uh, he's the, currently the most cited scholar in the subject area and is also highly cited in geography, regional development, sustainability, and global environmental change. In 2009, he was named the Xavier Science Director for the Great Thinking Arts, Humanity, and Social Science category winners. Professor Hall, the stage is yours. Thank you. I'm sorry for that long introduction. Salamu malam. Terima kasih dalam mengundang saya. Hello, Diman Diman Simu. Dan saya berharap dapat bergaya kembali ke Malaysia. Um, lovely to be back. Hello to everyone. Today, I'm, I'm probably going to be taking a, a contrary view to what most of the conference will be about. I'm even going to use a couple of slides I used last year because they're still equally relevant. And I'll start off with this one because it sums up the problem of sustainability for tourism and what we need to address. And what I'm going to be arguing is just thinking about technology in isolation is by no means sufficient at all. In fact, we've had a whole series of many years, many United Nations meetings, trying to come to terms with the issues of the limits to growth, the limits of resources, and the fact we only have one planet. Tourism as an industry probably hasn't come to terms with that yet. Why? Because we just keep on focusing on growth. And that's what most of academia teaches. And that is also what governments embrace. And it's interesting, obviously, thinking about transformation in the post-COVID environment. I think transformation we desperately need. Will I think we get it? No, I don't think we'll have any transformation whatsoever. You have a situation where governments are desperate. People are desperate for jobs, for income. And tourism is one of those solutions. 
although I think there will be isolated responses, I think they'll be overwhelmed by that vast desire to go traveling again and to welcome the tourists again, sometimes potentially even making it cheaper for them to arrive. We've had many years of searching for alternative tourisms. Every two or three years, we come up with another one. That's what academic journals and academics thrive on to keep the citation indices going. Come up with something new. Has the same problem disappeared? No, not at all. So we have a problem and the problem is there are limits to growth, there are limits to resources and we have one planet. And we have real problems because on top of that, we've had the not only COVID, but the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And we have actually constraints on mobility in some places. Will it make much difference? No. What's our context? I actually wonder how many of everyone listening has actually read the SDGs in full? I would probably guess 1%, if that. You may be aware of the headline, but do you know what lies underneath it? I'll give you a potted history. The Sustainable Development Goals grew out of the Millennium Development Goals. The Millennium De Development Goals focus more on developing countries. The SDG focuses on every country. It's therefore a, a global appeal, if you like. Essential to that is a focus on human rights. That was part of the UN debate. I'm quite sure most of you never read it, but that's essential part of the UN debate. In particular, gender equality and empowering women. And also, obviously, issues of climate change and biodiversity loss. How, therefore, do we, you, I, engage with that? because it's a major problem. Because one of the problems that you have when you're engaging these issues of development is that you have difficult politics involved, very difficult politics involved. And you have different groups with different interests wanting different things and having quite different ways of approaching these problems. In fact, there are many governments in many countries who don't see them as a problem at all. And it's only if you have a global perspective or a, new, or a systemic perspective and you realise these issues are going to turn around and bite you on the backside that you therefore have a concern with these things, I would suggest. If you think of sustainable tourism and the SDGs, there's some realities here. The vast majority of tourism research is not on sustainability. Only about, if we're lucky, 12 to 15% maybe a, a tad more addresses sustainability. The vast majority of tourism research is about growth and attracting people. The vast majority of research on smart or e-tourism or digital technology is also not about sustainability in tourism. It's about growth and increasing your bottom line. And that has its place. But it means in one sense, some of the big issues aren't even discussed. And I actually think we have an even bigger problem, if I'm being honest, and that even much of the research on sustainable tourism doesn't really challenge very much. It actually accepts sort of assumptions about the role of the market, the role of corporations, and the way in which issues are framed. I'm not saying everyone is like that, but most of it's like that. And it, it creates, creates issues, because therefore, what does the academy provide you with? And I would suggest that a lot of the academy is very one-dimensional thinking, especially when it comes to issues of technology and innovation, because often they seem to be automatically framed as being good. But are they? Because good is a normative concept. So how do we envision good? And that clearly has issues for sustainable development. And also there's assumptions made about individuals and being rational a moral yet calculating, it ties back you know, to part what Noel was saying. And I'm not saying people want, well, some people don't want to actually deliberately damage the planet or damage a place, but some do. Maybe not directly, but indirectly because of how they, they frame the problem or don't see a problem, or they think it'll be solved 10, 20 years, 30 years down the line by technology. And so then what are the actual individual capabilities to actually deal with these things? What does it mean for research? 
is research produced in a particular way to make it palatable for politicians so it gets funded? If you're too radical, maybe you won't get funded. But maybe we're also at a time when we need radical solutions. How do we reconcile that? And there is, as Latour would say, a self-fulfilling cycle of credibility in this. It is a major problem. It is a major problem because it actually frames how we envisage this relationship between technology, innovation, tourism, and sustainability. Where do we draw the boundary, for example? Do we just think of direct effects? Do we think of enabling effects? Or do we think of those structural effects? I, and I often find it ironic, and I have this at my own institution, that there's a, an embrace of technology and e-platforms. But at the same time, there's also research, research coming from staff saying um, students are alone and are more lonely than ever. People are more lonely than ever. They're more isolated than ever. And it's like, hang on, isn't there a connection here? Wouldn't it be nice to connect with people rather than a platform? Or with a chat box? And I find that fascinating in a tourism context because when I was um, working in the industry, that personal service dimension was important. That was what gave you authenticity and experience. How do we reconcile that? So is this embrace of technology about efficiency and keeping costs down? And maybe we think, well, the tourists will buy anyway because it's cheap. Or is it really about improving industry, whatever that means, and improving the customer experience? And these are issues which affect us when we think about sustainability. And this is a diagram I seem to show, show every presentation, and it's an important one. Because too much of the focus of what is discussed in technology and in tourism as a whole in sustainability is about making things more efficient, which is good in one sense. Efficiency is a good thing, using more for less. But, and this is the problem, the but is tourism, and it's starting to happen again, grows at a faster rate than efficiency. Therefore, your resources are still drawn down. So therefore, the problem becomes one of sufficiency. How much should we have to have a comfortable life, including as a tourist? And if you then pose that question, you then come back to that limits of growth debate from which the SDGs started in the first place. Some, if you look at it, legacy, some 40, 50 years ago. So Houston, we have a problem because how do these things connect? And I would suggest that many people don't connect them together. There is um, a problem of imagination or maybe it's a problem of education in trying to think about this. But even when you go to some of the re research on sustainability and, and digitalization, I'm not necessarily in tourism, it points out that the, the high expectations are not necessarily being fulfilled in terms of things like the social, economic, political environment, and of course, in terms of sustainability. So if we're then thinking about governance and destinations and tourism, what does it mean? Broadly, try and interpret the literature, it means you're, you're trying to foster ideas of modernizing government, increasing participation, often by using new ICT. And there's a range of areas, that one to 10 list you can see, they are the main areas of literature that's been identified in e-digital government and e-governance literature. Governance is only part of it. Issues of transparency are important. Issues of digital divide is critical. If you want to participate and be inclusive, what do you do with people who do not have digital access? Do you have the digital haves and have nots? And tourism, of course, generally is about those who are, uh, are wealthy in terms of time and money. And they're the ones which are assumed to have access to mobile phones or to, or to digital technology. But many people do not. How then do we include them in our brave new world of smart tourism or e-tourism? And also, how then do we understand governance? There is no single accepted definition. I always use the uh, 
the cop out actually of saying governance is the act of governing. But what we're really looking at is how do we design, implement and monitor public policies and strategies in terms of how the state, how government intervenes in tourism. If you look at the uh, literature, generally you could say there's two main ways of thinking about governance in tourism and elsewhere. One is that notion of steering. So you have a body steering in a particular direction and the other related ideas out of coordination. But a key question to you all, in terms of that relationship between governance and sustainable tourism, what is it we are trying to govern? Are we trying to govern the industry? Are we trying to govern tourists? Are we trying to govern residents? And also the resources which are tied in with that. And how do we do it? And it is an important issue because the notion of governance or good governance is a normative concept. It is a normative concept. What is, is, it, is it appropriate that we seek to reach? Who is excluded or included? There are also many different interpretations of what constitutes an appropriate government governance approach. There are different modes of participation, or in some cases saying you cannot participate. So who's excluded? How do we deal with that? For my notion of good governance, it's inclusive. Sustainability, SDGs, is about inclusivity. How do we ensure that when you have a digital divide? It's a fundamental question, which I, I don't see being addressed by those who latch on to smart tourism or e-tourism. And how is data treated? Because data is worthwhile for large corporations. So how do we care about that? And, and often that's interesting in terms of academia, because obviously these days there's brownie points given by how many you hits, hits you have on Facebook or LinkedIn or elsewhere. Yet to do that, you have to, to, you have to sell your soul and give privacy information to Facebook and those organizations. It's a crock, to use an Australian phrase. So how, therefore, do we include and what is the role of technology is this? Is it neutral or not? But, of course, in some countries, it's definitely not. So we have spyware. Or you don't even need spyware. You just you need to have large corporations which have your data. So how, how do we govern? What form of governance and modes of implementation do we use? If we take the four classic approaches, the top-down regulation versus the market versus networks versus community-based approaches, to what extent are they inclusive and, and democratic? Do we even care? And it is a question to ask because in many cases, um, Tourism can actually grow much easier if it's not inclusive and it's not democratic because you can build what you want. And there's a long history of, of autocratic regimes using tourism as a way of uh, generating foreign exchange. So I want us to think about the basics, not to get excited by the latest piece of technology, but ask some really fundamental questions. And I think if tourism is actually going to contribute to a better world and a more sustainable world, it needs to be much more transparent and honest than what it is at present. And it includes both corporations using technology and it includes a lot of academia. We need to lay bare many of those inherent biases that we have, that I have. But that doesn't fit you into what's taught. Usually what's taught is very narrowly technocratic. It doesn't question enough. And it's designed to provide fodder for industry, which I find interesting coming actually not from an academic background. You may not believe that, but originally I've never meant to be an academic. I fell into it. The most important skill you have in management or in work is to know how to think. To know how to think. And that is what is important for industry too, not just a skill base. Training is good, education is better. And here we think broadly in trying to challenge this relationship between technology, governance, and sustainable development. If you focus too much on efficiency and growthism and promoting technology and digitalization, then sustainable development has no chance whatsoever, and sustainable tourism doesn't.
What's important is that you should be asking very basic and very fundamental questions. What are the normative assumptions and the promotion behind, behind digitalization and governance? Are they made transparent? Innovations are not necessarily good. They're not. So whose notion of good do we use though? Is it clear? And good for whom? Going digital is not necessarily good. In some places it works and others it doesn't. So what assumptions lie behind its supposed contribution to the SDGs? My concern is, it's part of the big picture, as it is at the moment, a lot of the, the digitalization, innovation, talk about governance is actually all about growth and increasing visitor numbers yet again. It may be more efficient, but as I started off with, how sustainable is that going to be? And I don't think it's going to be sustainable at all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Hall, for this uh, great talk and critical views of the role of digitalization and sustainability and how this could be approached. Uh, we will follow by our third and last speaker, Dr. Camille Faure. Uh, let me introduce Camille. Uh, passionate about tourism, destination branding, sustainable management. Uh, Dr. Fleur started a career at Quebec Ministry of Tourism in Montreal, Canada, after being in charge of PR and local tourism development in a ski resort in the Alps. Uh, she joined Toulouse Metropolis Tourism and Economic Development Agency six years ago to work on international promotion and Congress development. Currently marketing manager at the Toulouse Convention Bureau, she has overseen the CSR Technical Committee for three years. With her engineering and marketing in tourism industries, academic background, she's been a lecturer in tourism, destination management, and event management since 2016. The floor is yours, Dr. Kami, and our audience which would like to hear more about your practical experience about destination management and marketing. Good afternoon, Kuala Lumpur. Uh, thank you for the introduction. So I'm Camille Four, I'm the marketing manager at the Toulouse Convention Bureau in France. I'm very honored to be with all of you today and I should say I'm a little bit impressed. Um, please excuse my English, I will do my best to stay clear in the keynote. I've been offered today to present a case study about the sustainability management at the destination as a DMO uh, regarding the international index we joined two years ago. All the process that led us, including the ISTIA professional challenge led it with the master's degree students in 2020. The sustainable management uh, in a destination is an endless issue. The purpose here is not to present a blueprint, but uh, humbly explaining the project that we, lead it, we are leading and the journey we're on. First of all, and at a glance, uh, Toulouse is the fourth city in France, renowned for its uh, university, obviously. <laughs> Numerous researcher, but as well to be the world leading capital of aeronautics, but also bustling a strong industrial research and development background in health, life science, and mobility one of the many strategic fields. Uh, Toulouse is a metropolis uh, open to the world and um, can boast a settled meeting industry, counting on a recently opened convention and exhibition center set by LEED, which means leadership in energy and environmental design construction. The destination management organization in Toulouse gathered four services, uh, which for each aims are to inform, attract and support project leaders in specified markets, leisure tourism, um, business and investing, meeting and events, and filming promotion. More specifically, the Convention Bureau has, uh, has a goal to gather and coordinate and promote the mice of our abroad, responding to the needs of meeting organizers, such as association, agencies, corporate companies. 
It has been several years that the meeting industry professional work on the sustainability topics, especially you know, reducing environmental impacts, but it becomes more and more important. And I would say it was powered by the sanitary crisis. Uh, it is nowadays a basic requirement for the client. For example, a company having a CSR internal policy will look for a destination or supplier aligned with their requirements. Uh, on the supplier point of view, involving a sustainable strategy has become a key to stay relevant in order to respond to RFPs, uh, for, is a reference for proposal. It is more and more common for the supplier to justify a third party certification. Uh, and as well, it is very important nowadays, it helps to attract and keep talents um, many recent inquiry research that the young professional are willing to commit in a company which support a sustainability policy. Uh, in those time of staff shortage, it could become a USP itself. And um, so for destination, it is an opportunity to structure, formalize, monitoring, incorporate, and in addition, of course, of the necessary limitation of uh, carbon emissions. Generally, the event industry is a pioneer in solution finding, and it is important to understand that the sustainability here is holistic and strategic. Environmentally, in order to lower the consumption carbon footprint impact on events. Also, the economic impact can be very important for the destination with adding these local expenses. And moreover, the benefit of an event could be what we call legacy, the social impact for the local community as industry, research and development center, but also local development association and population. In our case, the whole process of formalization has passed through the CVB and the local meeting, the local meeting industry partners. And I would like to specify that we're focusing here on the scope of the meeting management, the DMO scope. All the local and general policy is in the scope of the uh, governor institution. Our approach was driven as a result of all the monitoring we have done in on the market, uh, well set up on the sustainability management. At a glance, we applied a several step methodology inspired by quality management methodology, consisting in understanding the existing stakeholder systems, formalize B2B event cycle, uh, identify key actors, settling goals, objective and action plans. Uh, in order to implement the famous plan, do, check, act. As you can see, um, we started this process not so long ago, but we monitored a lot of markets. Uh, there were a lot of things which has already been done uh, when we started the process. I should point out that we started at the ground zero of formalization. And after monitoring uh, the market uh, from international corporation association we are a member of, we needed at this point to clarify and objectives, strategies. So we started a student project around the strategic planning of sustainability for the destination with uh, Istia master degree students, uh, which, has, which allows us to work on the basis of the formalization. Uh, in 2020, we joined the Global Destination Sustainability Index and started from there the evolution of action, catalysis of sustainability management for our DMO. And the CSR Technical Committee has been settled last year, leading a three scopes carbon footprint audit. And now we're involving local players. Um, we still are not yet a leading destination in France, but uh, thanks to the National Corporation, we're working on our improvement. One year before entering the DDS uh, for having the possibility to step back on the issues in order to clarify all the draft projects, we organize a one year professional challenge with Istia master degree students. Uh, it was really important for us to include the academics in the process, having an input from new professional generations. Uh, to help us design a roadmap uh, with a systemic analysis of the stakeholders and prefigure a draft of action plans uh, for us regarding our partners and our clients. Uh, that led us to the formalization of first the stakeholders inside the territory scope, uh, the whole supply chain for meetings uh, within the local policies and our role as a DMO and to respond to the challenges of the market externally to the territory 
client planners, competitors, and for each has been sketched their needs, goals, and attempts. Um, due to the complexity, due to its complexity, we have to understand that the project has a matrix. Many stakeholders are involved with uh, different expectations and goals. Um, to highlight some, <laughs> the DMO is one of the link between the client and suppliers. The client need to have an easy access to the targeted supplier, for instance, and the supplier have to stay competitive uh, so they commit in a sustainable approach. And as a DMO, the key is to structure and formalize uh, for a better structuration and promotion. So we have understood the core of the matrix. We are going to have a look at the GDS as an engine and the tool that structure and valorize the transition. Uh, we were the fourth city in France to join the movement. Uh, in 2022, three more have joined the process and we, we help each other sharing cooperation and be best practices. Um, as well, in 2020 was the year of the opening uh, of the new convention and exhibition center, uh, reaching the international environmental standards. It helped us as well to emphasize on the meaning industry commitment. So we joined the TDS in 2020. Uh, it is a program settled by professional meeting and even industry, uh, ICA, International Congress and Convention Association, IMEX Group, ECM, is European Cities Marketing, MCI, uh, which is our worldwide Congress organizer. Uh, the aim is to measure, compare, and improve the sustainability strategy, environmental, social, and economic, and the performance of the destination regarding the meeting and tourism industry. The GDS evaluate destination performance according to four uh, areas, key areas, environment, suppliers, social evolution, and destination management. The index produces an annual listing of the most sustainable cities in the world. In order to be listed, uh, cities must meet 70 criteria and achieve a high score in each of those fields. We knew that uh, we were not going to be top leader at the benchmark the first year, <laughs> but it was a good indicator to start. Uh, the GDS uh, was meaning industry centered powered uh, with an international corporation we part of, uh, internationally recognized and aligned with the SDGs and international standards. Uh, we decided to join the movement and use the GDS as a compass uh, to allow uh, to eco and to build up initiatives. As well, the uh, annual benchmark helped us to convince locally, the local governance with uh, technical and trustly indicators um, the GDS requires a certain level of formalization, so we have to we had to improve about the sustainability and business strategy formalization. Last but not least, uh, the power of the network and cooperation with leading sustainable destination was really a key. The GDS count on seventy criteria. Uh, concerning environmental performance, uh, local policies and infrastructures such as climate change commitment, carbon emissions, um, resources and water management. Those criteria are under the Metropolis umbrella. They highlight the, we highlight in the GDS what is leaded by the general local policy, but we cannot act on it. Or social progress area uh, is monitoring the city's performance against indicator for SDGs integration, corruption, personal safety, access to information, uh, using external sources such as the social progress index or corruption and perception index. For those criteria as well, we highlight what is set up at the local or national level. The supplier performance addresses the sustainability commitment and performance for the local meeting industry supply chain, including airports, event agencies, hotel venues. And finally, the destination management performance indicates the sustainability commitment for the DMO about the maturity uh, and the maturity of the destination, the leadership in communication and sustainability initiative to support clients and planners. The GDS uh, is for us a guideline in order to move towards the high standard, but certainly we cannot, as a convention bureau, which all of them, 
the benchmark and monitoring helped us to prioritize uh, for now some action in which we have some possible creep on uh, supplier and obviously DMO. So we have planned a timeline, prioritize some action locally concerning especially DMO and suppliers that we keep our monitoring and improving with the GDS inputs. Uh, with our local network, we highlight those already involved. And for example, hotel, we encourage them to commit in a third party certification. We also push to formalize in a better way our communication about the sustainable offer that client planners. To sum up this presentation, uh, further the necessity of changes, uh, the sustainability management is requirement for destination. In order to stay competitive, the world scene uh, for the B2B meeting uh, events. Uh, it is a time and money consuming fundamental project, but thanks to international cooperation programs, we now have uh, strategic keys to structure, helps guide and advocate locally. Uh, we still use the TDS strengths as a compass to drive the local transformation to help and to support the stakeholder, uh, valorize those already engaged align with the SDGs. There's still a lot to do, to develop, uh, to improve and promote, but it's a thrilling project. So thank you for your attention. I'll be glad to answer any questions next time, if you like. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kemi, for this interesting uh, uh, presentation, which provides us a very good case study of you know, GDS. Uh, we've got uh, some questions from our, our audience, which given in the links given to them. So I will start by the first question for Professor Scott. Uh, the first question is, do you have any example for responsible tourism from Queensland? I think I interpret this question as, is there any example of the implementation of responsible tourism happened in Queensland? Um, well, thank you. And a very good question. Um, uh, yes, there are a number. Um, I think um, Lady Elliot Island would be uh, one that springs to mind. Uh, so this is an island which uh, is on the a lower end of the Great Barrier Reef, the um, the uh, leaseholders uh, took this island over, and it was a bit degraded, um, uh, maybe twenty five years ago. And since that time, they've turned it into a, um, a you know off the grid. Uh, they've done rehabilitation uh, of the uh, of the uh, vegetation, um, and so on and so on and so on. So. Uh, uh, there are some examples where a tourism operator has not just maintained the uh, the uh, environment and their their site, but actually improved it and improved it significantly over time. While at the same point, um, while at the same time, they have uh, um, had good business. And in fact, um, it it does appear that if you can. Um, demonstrate your environmental uh, credentials, um, then there is a market willing to reward you for that. They still want a good experience, but um, they are willing to pay um, probably uh, some premium in order to uh, uh, for people who are who are doing um, uh, who are responsible. So that's one one example that springs to mind quickly. Okay, thank you. And uh, there is also another question for you. Uh, somebody is asking about what about service providers? I think they are directly up to date, daily influencer for responsible tourism. Well, uh, well, uh, yes, that's true. Um, what I was, but what I was pointing to is the fact that um, their ability to influence um, or to uh, demonstrate their commitment uh, is restricted to their trade area, for example. So um, 
they, uh, of course, any um, contribution to de or demonstration of responsibility, environmental ethics, and so on, is a good thing. It's just, um, and so we should applaud and reward people who are um, demonstrating their responsibility. It's just um, the ability of those people to make a significant change uh, is uh, restricted by the nature of their business. So um, I, I guess what I'm saying is the answer to uh, demonstrating responsibility in part comes from uh, recycling towels or uh, not using plastic straws. Those are good things, but they're not, they, they are steps along a path, but they are not making the major changes that we're required. So while a smaller business of various types can make changes and should be encouraged to, we're looking, we should be looking in other places for um, major significant improvements. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, perfect. So there is one more question for you, and uh, and the rest of the question is for Professor Hall and uh, Dr. Faure. Uh The last question is that given that sustainable tourism is mostly visionary, what's your take on the view that sustainable tourism is somewhat indeterminate? Uh, in achieving the SDGs? Uh, well, uh, I, I'd have to defer to um, Professor Hall for this. Uh, I think he spoke well in terms of the actual um, observable significant change um, that we have experienced, let's say, up until the end of 2019 um, in terms of uh, sustainable and responsible tourism or uh, contribution to SDGs. Um, there are there are significant um, contributions. I mean, tourism has got problems. One of the major issues is um, for international travel is um, uh, carbon emissions and pollution by airlines. Uh, so what do you do about that? I don't know. If, um, if we if there is offsets, well, that's good. You're still producing the pollution, but at least there might be some offsets. Um, where does that go? Where where would I, where could someone point to the enormous and significant change that um, those offsets have created so far? I can't see them. Mm. Okay, thank you. Th thank you very much, uh, Professor Scott. Uh, I think Professor Hall, if you wish, you can elaborate on the same question before I'm asking the question, which is really to directly targeted for you. So you may wish to further elaborate the previous questions if you wish. Um, no, I think I think Noel sums up well. Okay. Pass. Oh, thank you, Michael. That's that's uh, you're very you're I mean, I it's it's my it's uh, I'm having a great day. Thank you. <laughs> okay, perfect. So uh, the first question for you is, uh, Professor Hall, is that how should tourism policy frameworks be designed in non-democratic destinations and how tourism smartness may destroy a steady achievement in such emerging non-democratic, let's say, destination <laughs> countries? Well, it, it, it's almost, uh, but, yeah. it's almost a, a tautology, you know. What should I say should happen in a non-democratic uh, destination? Um, I'm a shameless, shameless Democrat, so and a, sh a shameless socialist Democrat at that. So I'm probably the last person you should be asking. Um, I, but to, you know, more seriously, I think it's I think it is a problem because I mean, you know, digital technology can be very useful, but it is also abused by numerous regimes whether it be from Israel to Russia to, well, I'll, I'll be controversial and say China, but that's only my own particular sets of values in terms of saying that. Um, and it's a real problem. I, I think one of the things that for me is really important as a generous kind of statement is that the digital technology to really assist in sustainability it does need to be transparent and people, um, have to be able to feel that their data is going to be used responsibly and it's going to be anonymized. 
I think that's a really important factor in terms of a lot of the way data is, be, is being used. Um, otherwise, in terms of the value of such such things, I think you're in trouble. Um, the non-democratic countries are, are, are always a problem in this matter. Um, if for no other reason you don't necessarily have the checks and balances in place that can assist you in having appropriate safeguards for individuals and having appropriate safeguards for sustainable tourism too. Okay, very good, thank you. Uh, the second question is that you were criticizing and debating the normative assumption behind the, the ideas of digitalization, the governance. Uh, what's your perspective on the role of digitalizations and how this could be adopted by the tourists to make a positive change? Yeah, I, I think I, I think digitalization can be positive, but I think what's important is that the normative assumptions behind it need to be transparent and whose digitalization is like companies, you know, and evidence for all this, companies like Airbnb, I mean, they're awful in terms of their abuse of, dem of democratic and non-democratic channels as well, actually. And there's a very, very, very good um, overview of them in The Guardian about two weeks ago um, and the way in which they subvert democratic processes. Um, uh, and it, it, so it's like everything. Digitalization can be a, a basis for good, but... Uh, you know, we have used this notion of sharing economy, but most of what it refers to is large corporations. It's not community based. Um, and that's where some of the shifts need to be in terms of, of having genuinely open internet data and digitalization. That is what is essential. Rather than having it having it marketized and, and turned into profit making. And, and, you know, I wish for goodness sake that we would stop describing companies like Airbnb as innovative. They're not innovative. All it actually is is a, is a huge bucket load of capital coming into a location and using that capital to subvert democratic processes. That is what Airbnb do. But so many people aren't willing to say that. Uh, and the, the, and but there are other corporations that do that. It's not just government; it's corporations which do this. Um, and so, you, to, to, to deal with that and actually get the the rights element and the equity elements that's part of the SDGs, that's why it needs to be transparent, and you need to have safeguards in place. Otherwise, all you have is is digitalization that's going to be supporting some form of autocracy or just reinforcing capital. And that's not going to get us as, uh, as a planet to a sustainable future. It's really straightforward. OK, very good. Okay. There, is also <laughs> the, the, there is also the last question for you before I'm, I'm going to uh, have the question for uh, Dr. Fo. In your conceptualization of, of the notion of the governments and the, and the inclusivity approach to the governance, where do you see the role of politics? In that politics, in you, yeah, politics yeah. Is, is essential to this. I mean, and, and politics in the sense of, of, of making power clear who gets what and making that clear. Um, that is, is such an important part of all of this. And using, using politics to enable a genuinely smart city um, and uh, a, a genuinely... Um, uh, sustainable city or sustainable tourism and a big shout out to my colleague Stefania Torso here and, and some of her work in looking at um, sustainable tourism cities because at the moment we have got smart tourism on one side and we've got smart cities on the other and they're not necessarily being in integrated and in fact a lot of what is you have in smart tourism um, doesn't really embrace the role of for example renewable energies uh, in destinations, and it really doesn't in, embrace inclusivity, which is kind of ironic, given that that is what the SDGs are about. And so, big questions of gender access and um, you know the the gap you have between those who have technology and those doesn't, and, and the, the the digital divide. Those issues need to be part of considering smart tourism and smart destinations. Otherwise, you're not going to get anywhere near 
um, sustainable forms of tourism or contributing to the SDGs? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Hall. So I've got two questions for you, Dr. Kami. Uh, the first one is, then can of when or where, let's say. Yeah, when countries embarrass tourism as a policy to provide economic development in rural areas, how do you justify the need to put the brakes on it? That's a very good question. <laughs> um, yeah. Just if I put the, uh, the, the question is, um, we have to accompany the, the clients, the best for it. It's, to be honest, it's really complicated as for a destination saying, no, uh, thank you. I don't want this project anymore. <laughs> so that's the first point. And um, I don't know, to, um, to put the brakes on the project is way more like, to how can we accompany the project to change and to transform? I would say this. Okay, thank you. Uh... And the last question for these sessions, uh, does idea of positioning my destination via sustainability uh, change the way how industry behave or the purpose is still just positioning versus transformations? Um, the, the transformation was started from the clients and from the providers and the supplier itself. So uh, the DMO is here like to, uh, to go with and to accompany again uh, these changes. And I think um, local players, like the first doing the mining industry, uh, they, are, they were the, the engine and the clients were the engine as well. So I think the transformation goes from itself. Okay, very good. And thank you very much for this uh, short answer to these questions. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. So that brings us to the uh, end of session and I will have a session summary. Uh, I tried to pick up some highlights from the uh, three presentation. I will start by the first one by Professor Scott uh, uh, that asked, I mean, provide us a very good question of asking and who is who and who does what when it comes to the responsibility and ethical and moral responsibility for and toward tourism, especially among those in the circle of decision making, those with a wide and legitimate influence rather than the tourists as individual who may not really have that power and legitimate power to make a change. Uh, and also the changing the social norms and the changing the ethical beliefs, which is also very, very important when it comes to implementation of, uh, of, of responsibility. Uh, Professor Hall also criticized our understanding of governance, which is a, mainly a normative uh, concept by, 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 by providing a conceptualization of this uh, uh, approach and also inclusivity approach to that by emphasizing that and uh, ask a fundamental question about what are the normative assumption behind the ideas of digitalization and the governance. And, in, and Dr. Kemi also gave us uh, some practical and contextual case study of how this nation, the sustainability performance could be performed in, in a destination such as Toulouse, which is uh, one of the main tourism destinations in France. Uh, I wish to thank everyone, all of our, all of our audience uh, for participating in the session. Of course, big thanks goes to the, all the three speakers from Australia, New Zealand, and France for, uh, for this great, uh, for sharing their the thoughts uh, about the role of innovation and technology in, in, in shaping and influencing this nation, uh, management this nation, governance and marketing. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Siamak, for wonderfully moderating the session, and also uh, Prof. Scott for very insightful perspective, and also Dr. Hall on providing very beautiful perspective and very different from others, and also Dr. Camille. 
So I'll ask all the participants if you can give a one word feedback. The direct link been posted on your chat or either you can scan this QR code to give a feedback. How did you really like this session using one word? Right, moving onward, we'll have a group photo, a quick group photo. I think we are on time already. So I'll encourage all the participants to open up your camera so that we can take a group picture. And I'll stop sharing my screen. Okay, still waiting for the participant to open up your camera. Right. So I'll go through quickly the pages. In page number one, one, two, three. Page number two, I'll give a smile, good smile. One, two, three. Page number three, one, two, three. Page number four, one, two, three. That's all. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining this session. Uh, 